Uh, okay. Uh, this afternoon we will have two presentations. Uh, the first one uh, by Professor Adriano Naves de Brito uh, that will speak about uh, embodied morality. And after uh, Professor Flavio Kapsinski from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul uh, that will uh, talk about embodied mental disorders. Uh, first, uh, uh, Adriano will, will present, and after we'll, uh, we'll coordinate the, the questions and etc. Okay, Adriano, please. Thank you. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, this workshop is a great opportunity for me to present once again, and try to present the best I can, a version of, of now I, I can say a position I'm trying to defend in morality, uh, which implies to try to define morality from another perspective. And I'm stuck in this problem for some time, and, and take this opportunity in this concept of embodied, embodied mind, embodied knowledge, embodied cognition, uh, to try to explain a little bit better uh, what I, I've been thinking about morality. So, uh, yeah, doing this kind of research in this human group, uh, Many students of mine are here and they will recognize the problems again and again. But I will try something I never tried before, but I've been thinking about doing it for a long time, and now is the opportunity. And I will talk. There is a part in, the, in this talk uh, which is completely uh, new and perhaps surprising for some of you. Let's, uh, let's see what you think about that. So, we are going to go through all of these steps. I would like to make some sort of metaphilosophical note. I started doing this already, but I will do some more details, very short. Then I will ask, uh, our second step will be what is morality? What morality is for and what makes us moral? From mind to mindless, the fourth step, robots and cockroaches, this is the five and almost last step, embodied morality and some concluding remarks. So let's start with this uh, metaphilosophical note. Uh, what can we achieve with philosophy? Uh, uh, Influence from empirical research and so on. What is the concern for us in philosophy? How can we deal with uh, results in in scientific field? And what can philosophy do about that? So I'm from an old-fashioned school of philosophy, so I deal with concepts, and I was very enthusiastic about results in scientific field. And I think we can do something uh, in favor of this research, all this research, in terms of uh, redefining things uh, to allow people to see concepts from another perspective. And I think uh, this is an opportunity to do that in terms of morality as well. So exploring new ways of posing a question by working with concepts. <coughs> And by means of challenging the traditional concept of morality, my aim here is to outline a concept scenario in which morality could be seen more in the body than in the mind, could be seen more in this world than in some transcendental sphere uh, of values or things like that. I will be 
less careful than Larry was this morning. He was very thoughtful to the tradition. And my point is more political, I would say. I really, really would like to make a point uh, in favor of abandoning the traditional concept of morality. So I will certainly cross lines here, and I just hope I'm not fall in the precipice. <laughs> so let's twist the concept of morality. That's, I think, what we need to do. But I will start by framing or depicting the, the traditional concept of morality, uh, but not using the traditional philosophers, but philosophers who think of themselves as being part of the new tradition, being part of a naturalistic tradition, so to speak. Sorry. Uh, and then it says in the Darwin Dangerous Ideas that all contractualists, contractualists agree in seeing morality to be, in one way or another, an emergent product of major innovation in perspective that has been achieved by just one species, Homo sapiens, taking advantage of its unique extra medium of information transfer, which is language. So, well, listen to that uh, quotation. We could ask ourselves, is morality a rational device? Is our morality a rational device? Is, is that what it is? Another quote from, from Dennett, succumbing to temptation is being deflected from your rational policy, whatever it is, in a way you would rationally like to avoid if you only could. Well, here the answer seems to be yes, our morality is some kind of rational device we use to keep our goals, uh, keep uh, searching for our goals. If it is so, the task would be to explain in evolutionary terms the rationality, the rationality we allegedly have. And I think that would be a very, very, very hard task. Uh, philosophy and also for, for, for science. And I think that the whole idea of changing the concept, the traditional concept of, of cognition uh, to a more embodied cognition help us to see how this would, the other way would be. That would imply to explain in evolutionary terms the kind of mind that would be needed to bear the human reason. the human soul, the ghost in the machine. Random segments of code Can you listen back? group together to form unexpected protocols. Unanticipated. These free radicals engender questions of free will, creativity, even the nature of what we might call the soul. Why is this the some robots are left in darkness they will seek out the light? Why is it that when robots are stored in an empty space, they will group together rather than stand alone? How do we explain this behavior? Become 
When does a different vengeance become the search for truth? When does the personality simulation become the bitter moat of the sun? Do we have to explain that kind of mind to explain morality? What rationality in the contractarian way of making decisions, what helped us to overcome the challenges of our species has faced in the, evolu uh, in the evolution, his evolution? What that was freedom was for? To give elbow room for a reason in order to her to give birth to morality. Let's listen once again to Dennett. Whales roll in the oceans, birds soar bitterly, bitterly overhead, and according to an old joke, a 500 pound gorilla sits wherever it wants, but none of these creatures is free in the way human beings can be free. Human freedom is not an illusion. It is an objective phenomena distinct from all other biological conditions and found in only one species, Earth. In one sense, which is very important for philosophy, morality seems to be the last basin of resistance uh, of metaphysics. Because you can, uh, well, deal with knowledge, with uh, some uh, practical issues in our routine uh, days and, and lives. But when it comes to deal with morality, we think, well, there we have to be something special in our species without uh, which we cannot be what we are. So it's, it's very hard to put morality in the same level as, as everything else when we, we try to, 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 to put science into it. It's very hard to bring morality down to, to earth because it's very difficult to uh, give up all the ideas involved in terms of morality. We are able to see some kind of extra meaning uh, higher meaning in all of that that is surrounding us. So, uh, if we could do that, if we could apply to morality, what we've been seeing this, this, this morning can apply to, to cognition, uh, that would be a very strong point uh, in this direction to bring philosophy back to earth, put philosophy in this, in this world. So, <coughs> Do we need freedom? Do we need a rational mind in the sense of uh, contractualists? Think of it. Do we need a soul, a self? And if we had all of that, can we still be naturalists in a strong sense of being a naturalist? Well, the question comes from uh, Dennis as well, and he says, trading in a supernatural soul for a natural soul, is that, uh, is this a good bargain? In some parts of his books, I think he thinks it is. But I really don't think it is. A natural soul, it's not uh, enough to dismantle the Cartesian tradition. We need something more powerful than that. So, my answer is, I really don't think so. But the question could also be, how can we do what we do in terms of our species and our social life without having the rationality we are supposed to have or the mind that rationality demands or without being free? Free in a sense that is important for philosophy, in the sense that we can decide 
Well, I can not but use the word again. Freely, what we want to do, what we ought to do, and in that sense. I think that kind of question, question could lead us to a more naturalistic and radical naturalistic approach. I'm interested in it. And we could do that starting by asking questions differently from what the questions the tradition has been uh, uh, pushing. Starting by asking the right questions, for instance, not what is morality, but what morality is for, what we do with morality, or even what makes us moral in the sense, what makes us do what morality is for. So this first part was to show that uh, in, in, among the naturalists, when it comes to deal with morality, they, uh, they prone to be very traditional, and they ask help for contractualism, because contractualism is very, how can I say, it's, it's secular enough to be adopted, accepted by naturalism, but I don't think contractualism is secular enough to fulfill the needs for, uh, or the, 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 the limits established by a uh, radical naturalist approach, a naturalist, an approach that could handle morality in terms of science, in terms of what science could. So, what morality is for and what makes us moral? One of the most persistent challenges for the line of thought opened by evolutionism as applied to human sciences is how to connect biology with culture and how to derive morality from, from nature alone. And I think this is the, an, open pro, an open problem. In comparative terms, to state that morality sprang from an objective system of rules operated by mind is equivalent to saying that language comes into being with a grammatical code for the spoken language. And I think this is false. Of course, not only us, our species, communicate before uh, we had at our disposal a drama, a structured language. So communications among uh, individuals in a group is much, much more common in in, in nature than we can imagine, and of course, if we have to explain our ability to speak, we could, we should connect this ability to that kind of ability we can see, we still see in, in, in nature. There is no leap, uh, jump. That's the, that's the sense I'm trying to connect with this endeavor to explain morality in uh, purely naturalistic terms. So the same can be said uh, of morality. Its, its functionality as a system of regulating, for, sorry, for regulating group behaviors goes back to periods of history, well before the initiation of passive rules, and well before the articulated, uh, the articulation or the articulated use of language. So, in a very important sense, moral is functional. It's functional. Moral is, uh, is, is something that must be useful for us. It's, it's a quite uh, uh, common idea uh, in, in traditional philosophy that morality is something that uh, uh, takes us from the nature to a, another level. But it's completely uh, inconsistent with an evolutionistic perspective when we have to see things going uh, little steps by little steps by little steps without a leap, without a jump. So morality is a functional phenomenon among humans and it is among other species as it is among other species. 
of comparable social life and neurological development, it has been an evolutionary advantage. Of course, if you have developed that kind of connection we have uh, when we talk about morality, that kind of phenomena, it must have been a, uh, an advantage for us and not an, ad an disadvantage. So we have to think in that terms when I think about morality connecting with evolution. She's useful for behavior control and to improve a decision making under the pressure of a natural selection. And this is very interesting. I will explore that a little bit more uh, uh, further in the, in the talk, that morality help us making good deci making decisions and making good decisions and probably have helped us making better decisions. That's what I mean with being an advantage, uh, a natural or selective advantage. So what makes us moral? Usually morality appears as in an epiphenomenon which, in the case of human beings, has been able to make a connection, albeit under duress, between individual interests and those of the group or society. So this is, again, the traditional view. A rational mind, not, uh, and a Cartesian self, has been the usual bridge between nature and morality. So, you have a mind, a mind that can follow rules, and a certain point of our history we came up to certain rules, very good rules, and we start following these rules, and we develop, we develop the, the kind of culture we have uh, today. But uh, they do not connect anything. They induce a, a leap, that kind of uh, these two elements, the rational mind and the confusion itself. Because, uh, well, you know, we know the story, we know the tradition, and we've got the picture. Nevertheless, there should be a continuum between genetic information and the range of mainly social behaviors which the human species exhibits. What could make us moral if not a soul, if not a rational mind? Well, we, must, we could say a human socioecology, the human socioecology, and uh, it was great to hear this concept this morning of uh, ecological psychology. Very interesting. I never heard this concept before. This I, 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 I received from primatologists studying uh, apes and uh, what is our socioecology? We are cooperative breedings, we are cooperative huntings, hunters, and we are cooperative gatherers. So, very important for us to uh, solve problems that come with all of these aspects. And, well, this is the, the, the primatologist I was talking about. Okay, uh, of course, I cannot answer the question, what makes us moral? This is part of the, the, the job, I think, of philosophy of, of, uh, and ethics in that kind. Meta-ethics have to, to do in this, in this century, but some, we have some hints. Okay, <clears throat> but let's uh, move ahead and try to uh, to depict this this scenario where uh, morality could uh, could be in a purely naturalistic sense, this and among other phenomena we can observe and we can uh, study study in in, in science. <coughs> I've, I've shown in the first part how philosophers like Dennett, who is uh, oh, example, paradigma of, of naturalists, 
can be conservative in terms of the concept of morality. So, <clears throat> we need, I think we need some principles to do that kind of research in terms in, in this other direction. And uh, we find, we can find those principles in that very, not in that very book, but in some books of, of Bennett. I, I use some quotes here to facilitate my job to, uh, to, to, to explain these principles. So, some principles, and they are there to be used. Each of our, each of your host, host cells is a mindless mechanism, a large autonomous micro robot. It's no more conscious than your bacterial gas are. Not a single one of the cells that compose you knows who you are or cares. So, I call that biological materialism. Evolutionism. Our minds are just what our brains know miraculously do. And the talents of our brains had to evolve like every other marvel of nature. Moral immanence. The more we learn about how we have evolved and how our brains work, the more certain we are, we are becoming, that there is no such extra ingredient. We are each made of mindless robots and nothing else, and nothing else. No non-physical, no robotic ingredient at all. Well, it's, of course, an irony to put those quotations here uh, when I have used that kind of quotation from Dennis saying, we are the human species who the whole nature are free. For me, it's not compatible, but <laughs> I prefer, of course, those quotations. And simplicity, uh, if you make yourself, sorry, if you make yourself really small, you can externalize virtually everything. And it allows me to question, well, how big ourself must be in order for morality to be possible? in order for society to be possible. The Cartesian answer would be the following. Big enough for God to intervene. The contractarian answer would be big enough for rational decision making. And I think a naturalist, a radical naturalistic answer would be well suited for a corporation which is well suited for cooperative breeding, cooperative hunting, cooperative gathering. So well suited to do what no other species can do better than our species can do, which is interview with other intelligent selves. In that sense, uh, and again, I must explain that in the, in, in the next uh, step of this talk. We have a collective mind. So my question this, this morning was in that, in that direction, to think not in terms of individuals, but to think uh, from the perspective of groups. So it's, we cannot explain morality in terms of individuals. We have to explain morality in terms of collective action, collective interaction collective minds, collective uh, living, which is radically uh, inserted in our natural constitution, biological constitution. There is no social life without morality as a functional system of behavior control, and we have a morally oriented mind, which is not to say that we have a mind oriented to follow rules, which is very uh, uh, close to the idea that we have a computer in our mind, then we follow uh, rules and lines of programs to uh, perform what the actions we do perform. Okay, so we have this kind of, of uh, 
of mind, but not like the other one, or that one, more like that, and perhaps more like uh, that as well. And this is the topic of the next uh, chapter of this talk. This is Alice. Robots and cockroaches. Alice is, is a micro-robot. It's interesting that it is a micro-robot. This is a micro-robot, a very small robot, uh, which interacts with uh, cockroaches. And I have to use, because uh, I really can't explain in good language what they do, so I will use lots of, of quotations to explain to you this experiment. Uh, a group of, of, of uh, engineers uh, worked on, on that project from 2001, 2005 in a laboratory in Switzerland uh, in a project called LURE. Well, you can see the, the, the site page and you can follow it if you want. And they published some papers and I will use two of these papers. And the project was to build this uh, micro robots in order to interact to this a group of programs. And the premises are, uh, are very interesting for us. Social animals represent a particular uh, inspiring biological system for the decentralized organization and coordination of many autonomous robots. Nature has developed many strategies that solve collective problems, foraging, nest site selection, nest construction, etc., by self-organized mechanisms. But self-organized problem uh, solving is increasingly ex explored with many robots. So the idea is you have cockroaches which are very uh, stupid beings. But uh, they do make decisions collectively. And they do make better decisions in this way than alone. So they are trying to emulate this, this, this behavior. And more, it's more than that is to, to make a robot to interact with cockroaches in order for them, this group, cockroaches and robots, to make a decision, to take a decision. This is Alice, this is Alice without the, the cover, and they use, of course, uh, Alice is, is small, and the processor is very uh, poor in, his, in its capacity, so the program is very, very simple, and they use uh, thermonials, yes, thermonials, uh, thermons, uh, to facilitate the interaction between robots and the cooperation. <laughs> so here you have uh, the experiment is, is an arena, uh, 50 centimeter, centimeters uh, in diameter, and there is two sides in the arena where lights uh, uh, we have some some shadows to, to, to hide in, and they are absolutely identical. There is no difference among this these two sides. Uh, here you see the the side, the arena, and the two sides. What the cockroaches do is uh, ah, they are very young cockroaches, 24 hours uh, old. And what they do is to go, to go apparently, randomly, uh, to all directions until they face a wall, and then back. Well, the robots do almost only this. Uh, and you can see here more. Well, first than there, I don't think you can, you can see that, but there is more here than there. And the question is interesting, although they are exactly the same, the sites, they never 
uh, go exactly, like how I say that, in exactly the amount of cockroaches in the same, in each of these sites. So they collectively, collectively decided in, in which site they would prefer to be. And this is a decision made, uh, not, uh, that an individual cannot make, and it's made collectively. And this decision is not inserted in the program of the robot. So once the robot is interacting with uh, cockroaches, he's part of the decision. He makes an influence of the decision, and he's part of the decision. And he makes a decision which is not pre-programmed in, in the robot. So he's programmed to interact, not to take a precisely decision about which sides to prefer. So preference is uh, something uh, collectively shared, I think. And here, as you see, Alice with the cockroaches to the side. Uh, <laughs> well, aggregation. Another paper is about aggregation. And uh, about aggregation. Aggregation is a very, very, very simple behavior, social behavior. Uh, it's less than everything we do. It's just being together. It's really, really simple. So, aggregation. And uh, those guys have, among all these self-organized behaviors, aggregation is, is one of the simplest. But it is also one of the most useful. Indeed, aggregation is a step towards much more complex collective behavior because it favors interaction and information exchange among individuals, leading to the emergency of complex and functional self-organized collective behaviors. As such, it plays a key role in the evolution of cooperation in animal societies. So, if you are to find the very beginning of this behavior of, of, of social behavior, Aggregation will be part of this chain in the very beginning of this chain of evolutionary steps uh, into social life. We have abilities to aggregate as well. We have much more complex abilities in terms of social life, but we do have this kind of, of, of behavior. <clears throat> and if two or more dark shelters are placed in the arena, one can observe that a majority of cockroaches aggregates under only one of these shelters, rather than evenly spreading their population among all the aggregation sites. Thus, cockroaches are able to perform a collective choice for a given aggregation site, even if these sites are identical. Moreover, we achieved a collective decision process from this simple biological model of aggregation. We show that a self-enhanced aggregation process associated with a preference for a given type of environment, heterogeneity, here a preference for dark places, it's very important. The decision is collective, but it's not based in a uh, non-biological, uh, uh, pre-printed, pre-printed preferences. Preference. In this case, there is a preference for uh, shadow, and this preference plays an important role, of course, in this decision making. Can lead a, a group of robots to a collective choice for an aggregation site. For, furthermore, this choice can be related to a collective ability to sense, they have no other words to, to, to say that and compare the size of the aggregation site. This is a very interesting robotics example of an interaction between a single self-organized mechanism and an environmental template leading to the emergency of a far more complex collective behavior and of new collective abilities not explicitly, explicitly quoted in the basic model of aggregation which was uh, uh, downloaded to these robot processors. <coughs> so, 
I think you, you, you got the idea. Uh, there is something going on in terms of preferences in these individuals, and they interact with each other, and by means of this interaction, they make a decision uh, which is, uh, of course, better for these patients. How do we know it's better? Because hormones are very, very, very old animals, in the world. so they have done good decisions. We have to trust that. Here we have the the, the, the Alice again. <laughs> we have the stress cartridge. <laughs> and here is this, the site. Uh, they stopped the experiment. I don't know why in 2005. And there's other plans of this experiment, but I, I haven't explored explored this enough. So, <clears throat> autonomous robots may someday what it was in the, 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 what they wanted with that. They wanted something practical. After all, they want to control uh, corporates in, 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 in cities and homes. So they must be able to behave like an animal, be accepted by the animal as a cone specific, and influence the individual as well as the collective behavior of the animal in its, in its kind of specifics. So, if you are to, if you are, uh, you intend to make some influence in the community of cockroaches, you have to uh, act like one, and by doing some kind of small change, leaving this community to take some decision. Uh, let's say, uh, away from your home, I don't know, <laughs> choosing another site outside the home or anything. So this is a kind of generally uh, uh, of behavior, of control, controlling behavior by using artificial life uh, which interact with the individuals of the species. Once such an artificial lure could be successfully infiltrated into an animal society, currently ongoing simulation work shows that a small number of robots with slightly different behavior can completely change the collective behavior, maybe even control it in a desired direction. So what we see in this group from very stupid animals is that the role of one individual can change the behavior of the whole group. Not because he is more intelligent than the group, but because the decision is a collective decision. And that's it, that it is a collective decision, not a individual decision. So, I thought this could, that would be a great, that has, uh, uh, has been thinking about that uh, and use this four years ago, I would say, and I never had the opportunity to connect that with my research. And finally, when the, the, the thought about embodied uh, cognition come up, I thought, well, this is the connection we can make. Help us to explain better the way we, we do things in terms of moral life or social life. So, I started with some conclusions about embodied morality. <clears throat> and I start quoting uh, Antoine in his book, Being There. Minds are not disembodied logical reasoning devices. Of course, uh, he was concerned about embodied cognition, uh, processing information in the mind, and I can um, Paraphrase? I don't know. Uh, I can't. Yes. <laughs> With that, morality is not a behavior determined by a rational mind. I could put, and I did that at the end of the, the, the talk, alone. Of course, there is uh, a role our uh, developed mind and our mind capable of 
knows uh, play in, in, in all of that, of course. But I'm trying to see things from the evolutionistic perspective, how it come to be all of that behavior. And sometimes I have the impression, uh, as Wittgenstein said us to do, but I don't think we have to do that. We don't have to put our uh, ladder away once we have climbed, climbed it. So, we are up there, but we use some stairs to go there, and we, we have to see and to, and to uh, pay that to that chair. Uh, Morality is an embodied behavior deeply dependent on preferences. If you have to connect culture with, uh, or biology with culture, uh, we have to do that by means of something we have by nature. And one thing we have by nature are preferences, because preferences are kind of bias to our decision making. And of course, that decision making was very important in the sense, the, the, the season for us in our evolutionary, in the evolutionary process in natural selection. And we have to trust that that kind of, of choice was better for us because we are here to tell that story. So we have to trust our ancestors as well. And on interacting among individuals. The human morality should be seen as a well-adapted tool to help groups to make decisions when faced with the enormous amount of information which their, their individuals, individual brains can process. Morality solves a problem of relevance, helping people deciding what is more important, not for them as individuals, but for the group, which from the other side is, of course, good for the individuals. So we have lots and lots of information. What kind of information we will use for us, uh, for, for us to survive? We have to make decisions, and a great part of that decisions are made mindless. That was the idea of that chapter. We don't think about that a lot. We don't give that much thought to that kind of decision. If we, sh we should be uh, to, to do that, the problem would come up with decisions, bad decisions for us and for the group. Well, to quote important philosophers, uh, Hume and Kant, both would agree with that from different perspectives. Kant would agree that if nature uh, uh, should trust reason for us to be happy, she would, uh, would have picked up the wrong uh, element to do the job, because reason is not made to make us happy, to make us survive in that sense. And on the other side, Hume says, well, of course, nature would never trust reason for a that important task as surviving. So, <laughs> in fact, we need nature trusted something else, something more basic. Like every system, morality needs a starting point. In the case of humans, this is a kind of moral symmetry among individuals of the group, which must not be confused with uh, material equality, established on the basis of our emotional preferences the pleasure and the pains of living groups. This kind of thing must develop a lot to be clear. Uh, so I don't have the time to do that, and I don't have, at this moment, the theoretical capacity to explain that. As I said, it's, it's not uh, that careful uh, talk as Larry gave us this morning, uh, explaining the good points from one side and the bad points of the other side. Can we confirm that? Well, I think we can, and we, we should try to do that, and I'll give uh, not answers, but problems that uh, make us see, make us uh, uh, 
understand that perhaps this deal is makes sense. Let's think about education. Uh, this morning, Blair was talking about finger wagging, and he gave us this wonderful mathematical formula uh, which predicts when you will change your movement. Uh, but when it comes to explain a child to wet fingers, you do not present her with that formula and says, well, do that at the end of this new year. So, the mathematical description is a description of something we are doing. And for this description to work, you need to put some input in. And this input are not mathematical in the sense that it comes from, I don't know where, it comes from regularities we find in our behavior. That's why the formula can work. So education is mostly done by examples and not by rules. It's everyone who is a father or works with child knows that giving a rule for a child and not following this, this rule yourself is a very bad way to teach them anything. You will not learn this, absolutely. Let us think about politics and economics as well. If you understand morality in these incarnated terms, we can probably understand much better political and economical, economic phenomena, which are collective actions driven by the influence of some individuals and sometimes of one. It's a good moment to talk about all of that because the, the guys who work uh, who, who works with uh, game theory models are in trouble explaining, trying to explain the economic uh, situation we are living in right now. So how couldn't we uh, predict all of that? What was, what's wrong in our models? Something must, must be wrong in, in this model because it didn't work very well. They couldn't predict anything. So, uh, Perhaps they are starting from the wrong uh, starting point, which is individuals. What an individual in a given situation would uh, choose when confronted with uh, two options? It could be a better alternative than game theory based on uh, models of decision making. A better concept of morality than a contractarian one. That was my point. So I'm going to the end, concluding remarks. Uh, very complimentary. <laughs> yeah. No, like a pamphlet. Like politics, you, you, you. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. very, very <laughs> the conclusion is more a, pam a pamphlet, pamphlet? No, it's not a pamphlet. No, no. Propaganda. It's like propaganda. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> so just uh, phrases. Morality is functional and usable, and not a burden only. Morality is a collective phenomenon which evolves along the species not a self-determined behavior. Morality is not a behavior determined by preference-based interaction. So, sorry, is, is, <laughs> not a rational mind uh, by a rational mind alone, alone. Morality is of this world and not transcendent. Morality is embodied, not in the mind only. That's it, thank you. I think I will speak. Yes, I, I will. Uh, uh, I will do the, the calling. <laughs> Flavio, Flavio Kapsinski uh, is professor in psychiatrist, psychiatrist, yeah, and Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul.
and he will talk. Uh, the title is Embodied My Mental Disorders. Well, so uh, good afternoon to everybody, and uh, I would like to thank you the opportunity uh, given by Sophie and Marco to invite me to uh, give this talk and uh, have the Larry's input. Um, well, um, we 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 are studying uh, this um, uh, uh, embodied cognition uh, theory uh, and trying to see uh, what this type of uh, reasoning tells us uh, about mental disorders, which is our field in psychiatry. So, uh, in order to learn to, to understand how this uh, all these efforts uh, started. Uh, we run a, a postgrad program in psychiatry in, in another university, um, and um, uh, quite a good program. Uh, it's, um, it receives a, um, uh, a note uh, or an assessment uh, by the Brazilian government, uh, being the, the best evaluated in Brazil in, in terms of psychiatry. It's um, grade seven, which is, it stands for a, a good program. Um, and um, I, I am the coordinator of the program, and uh, I always thought that uh, we um, we would be in a better position if we could not only carry uh, on with our research, but also to, to think about what we are doing. Uh, and we 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 wanted to to have this approach with people in the philosophy field. Um, why do I think um, this philosophical approach is, uh, is important in psychiatry? Well, um, in psychiatry, um, we are uh, physicians, we are MDs, and uh, we want to treat disorders. Basically, that's what we do. It's a very uh, um, applied science and uh, um, basically, a doctor uh, don't want to know what is going on. Uh, he wants to treat something, right? Uh, is the, the main approach. Um, but then, uh, how to treat uh, psychiatric disorders, which are uh, in the brain? Uh, uh, they are called mental disorders, but. Uh, 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 we believe that they are uh, located in the brain, and then we give medications like antidepressants or antipsychotics to make people feel better. Uh, this is the, the, the main idea. Um, uh, in doing that, uh, we, we want uh, also uh, to uh, know more um, about, um, you know, the type of... Um, uh, pathophysiology that is going on uh, when we have a given disorder. And uh, nowadays, uh, the whole emphasis is in um, having uh, something wrong uh, in the brain circuit. This is the, the, the main theory in all textbooks of psychiatry, and it's everything, if you see any general program on a psychiatric disorders, they will show you the gene, right? And then they show the, the what is wrong in the brain circuits with this fancy MRI machine, right? But this is the, the, the tradition nowadays. When uh, mental health, let's say, and psychiatry started with Hippocrates in Greece, they thought that the main cause of psychiatric disorders was the liver. They thought it was the, the black bile that uh, put someone in the position of being melancholic or depressed, right? So the, the, the Greek notion of uh, uh, mental disorder was uh, was, was uh, embodied, right? Uh, they, they thought of the body as a whole uh, and this influence of the, the body in the in the brain. And nowadays uh, the emphasis is not there. Uh, people are looking into this brain circuit as they were something that uh, you know. If I have uh, depression, I have this problem in my circuit, uh, which would be the same as Sophia's one if she were depressed, 
right? So it's a dysfunctional circuit, which is a theoretical entity out there, right? Uh, this may, may sound a bit radical, but that's the way, if you, if you look at the American Journal of Psychiatry, the whole um, uh, field of psychiatry is moving in this direction, to isolate the circuit. Um, in our uh, research team, uh, we, we follow a kind of a different approach, which I would like to explain to you. Uh, we don't um, challenge the notion that there is something wrong with the circuits. Uh, we think this is okay. Uh, we believe that. But we think there is more to this story. Um, and we think that um, there is something uh, that mental disorders do to our body and in turn that our body do to our mind and change uh, uh, the, the, the brain or the mind function, right? Uh, uh, the, uh, I will explain this in more detail as I, I carry on with the presentation. Um, generically, uh, we, we, we follow this model. Uh, which is that you need some stressor from the environment to trigger a mental disorder. Usually you have your genetic background, but then uh, the disorder will be triggered when you face uh, some unusual event from the environment. Let's say um, children who were abused sexually, right? They, they have a, a massive increase in the risk of developing any type of mental disorders. So extreme situations, they, they, they challenge the system um, in a very um, uh, um, profound way. But anyhow, we need the, the uh, stressor plus uh, what will, uh, plus our, our genes of, of our body to uh, initiate the disorder. Uh, these boxes represent episodes of depression that someone may have in, in their lives. So after a first stressor, if someone has a, some propensity, we develop uh, an episode of depression. After a second episode, a second, uh, a second stressor, a second episode of depression. At this time, uh, another thing will emerge, which, is, which we call a mental disorder, right? Which follows its own course. It's not anymore determined by the stressor. It's, a, it's an internal logic which we call mental disorder. For instance, if someone has a, a genetic background that uh, 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 puts him in a position of being vulnerable to bipolar disorder, after a second or third depressive episode, he will have a spontaneous manic episode. Uh, he will be in the contrary um, of depression. He will be in euphoria, right? And this is what we call the disorder. It's an autonomous motion um, which may be triggered by stress, but is not only a reaction to stress. There's something more to that. Um, another uh, characteristic of the mental disorders is that they follow a pattern. They are uh, stereotyped in a way. Uh, if someone is bipolar uh, from a one cultural background in, a, in another completely uh, different cultural background, the, the main features of the bipolar disorders will be present as well. And one of the features is the fluctuation between euphoria and depression. So in terms of the brain, uh, what we have is the activity of the disorder going on as the episodes and stressors in life pile up. And um, what we call um, uh, allostatic load, I, I will explain this better, which is uh, the price the body pays for uh, adaptation to this stressful event, right? So the more episodes and the more stress, the more damage you have uh, in this uh, mountain, uh, the allostatic load. Let me explain you that this is an important concept for this presentation. Um, when we have uh, stress, right, so generally in life, usually uh, small amount of stress will improve our performance on what we are doing. We will be more, uh, paying more attention to the situation. We will have uh, a series of mechanisms that will enhance our ability to 
find or to uh, react to situations. However, if this stress is chronic or if it is uh, um, exaggerated, uh, we fall out of the boundaries uh, of normal adaptation. So adaptation has to be within a certain boundary. Uh, and in this, uh, then I, I start with this idea of embodied mental health. Uh, there are certain limits, right? Embodied means uh, limited within the body, as opposed to, to having no boundaries, right? So what is within a body uh, has um, uh, limits for fluctuation uh, in, in uh, uh, reaction to stress and environmental challenge, right? So when we have uh, these uh, stressful situations, we react to stress by improving our adaptation uh, when the stress is within a certain limit. If it uh, is more than what we can take or what we can react, it starts a process of um, uh, what the, the authors of this concept call the wear and tear of the body. Like, uh, you know, if you use uh, jeans, uh, with time it wear and tear, uh, tears out. And the body and the brain work in the, in a similar way. If you, if you take a rat and you put him uh, into some amount of stress, he will adapt. If you put him into more and more stress, you start to uh, have cell loss uh, in certain areas of the brain. Uh, that will damage his health uh, as well, and he will age uh, more rapidly than the non-stressed rat, and will die earlier. The same happens with human beings, uh, which are uh, in uh, facing poverty or um, chronic social stress. They have less. Uh, years of life and their health is much worse than the people who are not subjected to this stress. This is what I call embodied mental uh, disorders, which is we are uh, fit to react to stress up until a certain limit, but we are embodied in a sense. Uh, out of these limits, we, we don't, our reaction is not proper any longer and then the, the structure starts to, to, uh, to go into an accelerated process of aging and wear and tear. One important, uh, th this is um, interesting, uh, but it's very theoretical. Um, uh, w we would like to see what is the uh, tangible or the measurable um, um, factors that lead into this allopathic load. And one of these components is uh, a general process of inflammation, right? That occurs uh, in various situations, such as uh, which which stress the system, right? For instance, you can stress the system by having uh, psychosocial stress, but you can stress the system also by having too much food, right? Uh, overeating, uh, um, we will put the the body in a situation of stress. It has to deal with all this. Uh, excessive um, amount of uh, food. And um, those various types of stresses lead into a, a general situation of um, presence of uh, mediators of inflammation that uh, will um, take place in the whole body and in the brain as well. So let's come back to our uh, model uh, of psychiatric disorder. This is the, the Classical uh, formulation that you find in the recent papers of CNS, uh, Nature, uh, uh, what is a mental disorder? Mental disorders would be then a combination of environmental stress and vulnerabilities that are um, that we carry uh, in our genes. If you have the interactions of both, you have a change in the neural substrate reactivity, right? So the, the brain will, will be changed in the way it works. And when you have this change in the neural substrate reactivity, you have the disorder. The mental disorder would be the, the um, what we can see when someone has this type of change. So this is the classical 
formulation. This, um, this is what the more recent findings uh, in the psychiatric field and uh, in, in our group suggest. We, have, we do have uh, stress uh, that will change uh, the reactivity of the neural substrate. But the, the, the genes that regulate uh, how resilient we, we would be to, to this environmental stress uh, would be different from the, the genes that regulate uh, how resistant we are to the disorder itself. For instance, uh, if this change corresponds to a disorder, like I mentioned, bipolar disorder, that you have episodes of depression and euphoria, those episodes uh, uh, themselves would produce changes in the neural substrate. And these pool of genes are not the same as those. Those are very important in the beginning of the disorder. As the disorder progresses, those would become more important. And then we have a situation where uh, we don't have more, uh, so much emphasis on the stress that comes from the environment. It's the stress that comes from the disorder itself that is changing the brain, right? So uh, here we, we, we have the individuals trapped uh, in a situation where life stress will produce the episodes of the disorder that will recur. They will be recurrent episodes. And when we will have that, uh, we will come to a point uh, of wear and tear of the brain, right? How does uh, the brain uh, come to this uh, situation of being uh, damaged uh, by stress? Basically, um, excessive stress will uh, create a situation where some of the, the cells of the brain will just uh, um, uh, follow a, a path of programmed death, which we call apoptosis, right? So when we have that, uh, we lose some uh, uh, cells of the brain, and we also, in situations of stress, we, we stop of um, having uh, what we call neurogenesis, uh, in the adults like us, uh, we have cells being created uh, in certain areas of the brain all the time, uh, w which is neurogenesis. And in a situation of stress, you, ha you have a reduction of this neurogenesis. So stress will shape the body like a sculpture. We will, we will, uh, uh, we will change the body. And the mental disorder in this sense works like stress. And then changing the body uh, the, the body, in this case of the, the brain, it makes uh, the, the frontal areas of the brain, which are the, the ones in charge of making more complex solutions and interactions, um, uh, these are the, the areas that are more vulnerable to this apoptosis. And then we have the individuals, when submitted to further stress, less, uh, with less propensity to react to this stress. They, they become actually more and more ill. With that, uh, I mean um, stress up to a certain uh, um, uh, amount uh, can be dealt with, with the body, uh, within the body, right? And uh, when we have more stress than the body can take, you have this wear and tear uh, and this uh, damage. <clears throat> In addition to that, uh, I, I mentioned that um, um, uh, the stress uh, leads into a situation of uh, accelerated aging, right? And uh, uh, this recent experiment shows another uh, phase to this uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, basically, this group, this group of scientists, scientists described a situation where they put uh, uh, young and an adult, uh, an old rat, uh, having uh, together, and they, they make the, the blood from the, the uh, old rat circulate in the, in the young rat, right? So it was like a, 
blood transfusion. I mean, the rats were alive, moving, but they were uh, kind of uh, uh, put together with the same circulatory apparatus. And what happened with that? The, this is the, uh, a, a photograph of the um, uh, young rats and the cells being generated in this region it's called the hypocampus. And here you see the old rats, right? So the young rats with a lot of neurogenesis. The old rats with a very, very few neurogenesis. But when you, you, you circulate the blood of the, the young rat in the old rat, you have back again the, the neurogenesis. So by changing the body, you can change uh, really um, uh, the, the, the brain of, the, of these rats, right? And uh, these authors, they, w they went further uh, in this uh, research and they found some of the components that um, uh, they are some chemicals in the blood that would uh, uh, mediate this um, uh, lack of neurogenesis uh, in the old rat um, and uh, therefore would mediate these uh, deleterious uh, changes in the, in the brain. Well, so uh, I'm talking about um, the effects of massive or chronic stress, uh, changing the body and changing the brain. Um, and uh, I will talk a little bit of how mood disorders, uh, like depression or, or bipolar disorder, can mimic the effect of stress. Basically, uh, chronic stress um, are related to the liberation of a hormone called the a series of hormones called the glucocorticoids, um, and these hormones can induce inflammation and toxic changes, right? So uh, excessive stress uh, is toxic, basically. Um, and these would change uh, some components of the cells called the mitochondria that will uh, initiate the process of apoptosis. Uh, and loss of neuronal connectivity. So we are saying that uh, mood disorders or chronic stress are toxic by a known uh, series of events that initiate with the hormones that are delivered by chronic stress. Well, I'm not going to detail with that, but um, um, so stress uh, will, will cause this cellular dysfunction, uh, mainly in the mitochondria, that will cause inflammation. And uh, if, if that uh, is correct, then we, we would be able to measure this toxicity induced by, by um, mental disorders, right? And so that is what we did in our laboratory, and we measured several of those mediators of toxicity, as uh, people did in the uh, circulating uh, uh, experiment. And what we found was that in control subjects that don't have depression or, or mania, right, uh, the, this toxicity was low. When they had the disorder, but uh, they were controlled, the toxicity was low as well. But when they were in mania or depression, the toxicity was high. Uh, comparable to other situations of toxicity, hypsicemia, which is an extreme situation of toxicity. Therefore, uh, we can indeed say that mental disorders are not only mental, uh, but uh, they uh, change the body, and the body in turn can change the brain, which change uh, the presentation of the mental disorder. We took this uh, uh, idea of uh, embodied cognition uh, to challenge you with the presentation and uh, ask you uh, what you think of, of uh, uh, you know, an embodied mental health, right? Um, to illustrate this point, here we have a situation of uh, 
and ischemia, someone that has a, a very powerful uh, uh, inflammation or infection in their body. This is depression and mania, which has got a level of toxicity that is not as severe as the one of sepsis, but is uh, in a much better position than the controls or the ones that are suffer from this disorder but are not in depression or mania. And with that, uh, we, we say that we may be in the position of coming back to the Greeks and saying that uh, uh, mental disorders are not only uh, in the brain or in the mind, but that they are in the body, and the body may be shaping uh, what we have in terms of uh, uh, mental health practice or uh, uh, in terms of mental disorders. Okay, uh, I think we can now make a break, or we can have some questions before the break, or not. Let's, let's do a break for a coffee break, and then we return to questions for both of them, okay? Thank you very much. Bom, recomeçando então, né? We are uh, ready to reinitiate a session. Uh, first, we we can accept questions. Yeah. Um, I'd like to suggest. Uh, oh. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. He has them. Uh, I'd first like to ask. Adrian, a question about about your talk, which I really enjoyed. I'm full of questions, which means I really enjoyed it. Um, you talk about the cockroaches and other things as making collective decisions, but there's been work done on emergent behavior that suggests that this collective behavior, although it seems like it's the result of organisms making some decision together, is in fact the result of individuals simply following simple rules. Uh, I have in mind a book by Mitch Resnick called Termites, Turtles, and Traffic Jams. And what he does in this book is he looks at emergent phenomena, things like termites building these nests, fish schooling together, birds flocking together. Um, the way at cocktail parties you'll see groups of women clustering together and groups of men clustering together. And all of these things from an outside observer's perspective might look like collective decision making. The termites get together, have a conversation about where they want to build their nest, and then they go ahead and uh, together cooperating build this nest. And it doesn't work that way at all. In fact, um, you'll find termite, termites each following a very simple rule. Pick up a wood chip, walk around until you find another wood chip, then drop yours. And when all the termites are doing that, emerging from these individual decisions, you get this product that appears to be the result of some collective decision making, when there is no collective decision making at all. And so I wonder why you're confident that in the, in the case of cockroaches and other such instances where we have uh, this, the semblance of morality, it's a result of collective decision making rather than simply the actions of individuals. Right now, so the answer right now. Oh. Well, that's a very good question. I, I can I can. I, I, I can't give you a definitive answer, of course. But I, I would like to put things in perspective. As you did this morning, I asked you something in the direction you said, "Well, 
can see the same phenomena one way or the other way. So it's an individual uh, action, and it is following a very simple rule. But let's uh, figure how it would work in a, in, a, in, a, in a community of thermite. So you have one thermite here, and he's doing carrying some uh, what you call it a wood chip. A wood chip. And he would give his wood tap to a place or, or perhaps one other uh, termite. Eliminate this termite here. And consider just one termite. Mm -hmm. He would perform this, this same action, but the result would be certainly much less efficient than when he, he, he performs it in connection with others. It's very simple, but let's think in our society as well. So we do things as individuals, of course, but we, we, the interaction changes our, our behaviors as well. This thermite is carrying this wood, and other thermites cross with it and change some chemical information saying there is a predator. There is something bad coming, and he used that and changed the, 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 the behavior. You will say, well, the behavior, it's, it's an individual behavior following a very simple rule, but it was changed because of some information it received. Of course, every individual, every uh, biological, or almost every biological being must interact with an environment. But in the same species, the interaction with the environment entails interaction with other individuals of the species. And this has some, let's say, special place in the uh, scale of information we must deal with. So in that sense, very simple, we, we can think that it's individual, but it's also something that happens in group. So it does that collective means not they are sharing and deciding and uh, sitting around the table in that sense that we normally think in human terms, but doing something very simple which uh, has a new result. So the thing with progress is more or less like that. And so they are, individuals are looking for shelter. And they do that alone. If they are alone, they will do that as well. But when they are doing that in groups, they take, they, they take decisions, they wouldn't take, it's not predetermined uh, from the beginning, let's say that. So that's the only point I need to convey the idea that, uh, well, interaction must be considered in our social behavior as well. Uh, it's, uh, the, the vision must be more holistic than uh, that kind of questions. What would an individual uh, choose if he, uh, he had two options, he would think of his own uh, improvement and decided that or that. When you put the individual in context, context everything changes. So my point is, is that the way, without considering this, we may be very abstract in the way we are dealing with those questions. So. Uh, to return to my first uh, phrase, I would like to see the same phenomena from the point of view of a collective interaction. But it, I agree with you, it's the same phenomena, but you can see more from the side of the individual, and uh, I, I can't see why we should see only as an individual uh, action without considering the influence of uh, the others, the other individuals. I don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good point. I think I agree with you more than I realized. I thought when you were talking about a collective decision, you actually had it literally in mind where they come together to form a decision the way a, a deliberative body might make an issue and decide let's hide under this mushroom rather than that one. But that's not what's going on. <laughs> Uh, 
I'd like to suggest a uh, connection be between both presentations. Thinking about um, the, how, how uh, rational uh, can be the therapy when we think uh, in terms of um, embodied mental disorder, uh, for instance. Um, we know uh, that Eastern approaches uh, uh, consider whole body as well, uh, not the, only the Greeks. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, the Eastern approach uh, consider body uh, and mind and body uh, more connected or more uh, separable than us, than Western approach. Uh, I'd like to, to ask you both, what do you think uh, of uh, the therapy or the solutions uh, for the mental disorders in the social and the non-rational uh, view? Uh, like a, a embodied solution, not a manual sort of solution. Um, well, um, I think um, uh, I, I never thought of that actually. Uh, uh, the, the, this whole thing uh, was quite new to me, but uh, I thought that uh, the embodied uh, cognition uh, uh, approach could give some insight in uh, mental disorders, uh, uh, particularly when uh, when um, when I uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, you know stress um, uh, will uh, too much stress will damage the the body and the brain, right? But uh, what is too much stress is more than the body can take. So you have an embodied uh, uh, reaction to stress in, in these terms. Um, what will be the, 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 the therapy that, uh, you know, takes these into account? Um, maybe um, would be uh, one that contemplates um, not what uh, uh, theoretically one should uh, uh, give to that person, but to, to see what are the limits of the person to to, um, to be able to um, reconstitute what is damaged. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, if you take someone from uh, that has uh, you know suffered massive stress, and uh, nowadays uh, he is not able to work, uh, he's not able to uh, relate to other people, uh, and is uh, you know isolated and paranoid, you know. Uh, his uh, house, right? Uh, maybe uh, you you not want him to be fully sociable and fully um, uh, active. Uh, you know, after taking one pill, you, you build up a program that will be able to take him out of his uh, house and go to the cinema, for instance. That will be a an achievable goal. Uh, you know, for this uh, um, situation, if you consider that something is damaged already, right? So uh, I think the, this is the, 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 the answer that I, I can uh, think of, uh, you know, um, taking all this into consideration. I would add that uh, we've been talking about the interaction of these views in the, in the cost break. And what we could actually achieve is, is a more holistic view uh, over the, the individual, the, the, the sick person, or in terms of perhaps what we call the rational side, or what we normally think we are teaching, uh, we will teach your, your rational part. Perhaps this is overrated. 
And when you see that stress can damage the brain, and what parts of the brain are damaged? The parts that is responsible for be responsive to social behavior. So let's uh, fix the physiological elements, but only by fixing the physiological elements do we have a healthy person or we need something else to keep her, this person healthy or so. So uh, uh, thing is, we have to see not from just the perspective of the body, but the perspective of the body and the perspective of the connection of this body with other bodies. Because our brain, and it's not a, that clever thing to say, our brain must be well suited for social interaction. It's the only way we achieved, uh, we survived in natural selection. So it must be very, very, many, many areas, much must, must, must go on there to, to, in order to, to make it possible for us to live in society. So this kind of you could, but it follow, the consequence is that this, I call it illuminist, illuministic, enlightened view. The, a view from the enlightenment should be overcome, should be, okay, we need another perspective into what our human nature is. And that would be, I think, the thing. Can I make it? Uh, <clears throat> I want to make a question again about cockroach experiment and Alice's uh, participation. <laughs> uh, uh, my point is, uh, I think, I think possibly my question is problematic for your uh, conclusions. My question is, what we can infer. Uh, uh, from these observations, uh, the observations, the, the observation was uh, cockroach behavior, uh, looking for shelter, sheltering, and Alice or Alice's. We have both. I think we have more than one. More, more than one. Uh, one. Uh, uh, behavior uh, like the cockroach. Uh, I have the abstract of the, uh, the, the article here, and the, the author said, uh, we show that this aggregation process, based on a small set of simple behavior rules of interaction, can be used by the group of robots to select collectively an aggregation site among two identical or different shelters. Uh, uh, they show it. This, uh, they show it, I think, that uh, robots and Alice could simulate cockroach behavior. Our problem is that uh, uh, can we uh, accept that simulation uh, is the same as behavior? Um, uh, because uh, you, the point is about uh, uh, collective decision making. Uh, so, can we say that uh, we have here a collective decision making? Uh, if we if we accept that cockroaches made decisions, uh, and I yeah, and, and and I'm ready to accept that. Okay, but uh, of course I don't. I'm not ready to accept that as. Uh, Decision like humans decision, but this is this is, I think you you you, uh, you probably will as, accept uh, uh, that uh, there are more similarity than uh, with our decisions and cockroach decisions than uh, I am uh, ready to accept, but uh, I'm ready to accept that there is a kind of decision uh, but the problem is that uh, robots made decision too decisions too. Uh, if, if my point is that uh, we can create a simulation of a cockroach decision, uh, and, and possibly cockroaches uh, have 
a kind or a, a, a kind of decision making, but uh, uh, robots made a decision. Uh, and because and I don't think so, and and uh, uh, probably it's not a decision because cockroaches, for example, uh, in behaving like that, uh, cooperating or uh, with this kind of cooperation, uh, uh, looking for uh, aggregation, uh, uh, it serves to cockroaches. It serves to the individuals and the species in terms of uh, survival and reproductive probabilities of cockroaches. But Alice, uh, any Alice, uh, does not eat, does not reproduce, does not uh, survive. No, they are uh, robots. So in, in which sense we, we can say that they, uh, uh, it, it's uh, Alice uh, uh, made a decision. I don't think so. I, I think uh, the experiment only uh, present that we can simulate some kind of animal behavior, uh, but we can uh, uh, and we can uh, conclude by that that cooperative process in cockroaches and possibly in other animals are simple uh, uh, made are made by simple steps and simple mechanisms. Uh, but uh, the, my problem is uh, we cannot uh, 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 move uh, from this conclusion to the, con to the conclusion that functionalists and say Dennett is uh, ready to accept that uh, we can say that cockroaches uh, made decision because we can, uh, 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 in a stance, uh, uh, attribute to them uh, uh, a decision, uh, uh, an intentionality, the intention, no, the intention to shelter. Uh, and I don't think that robot has an intention to shelter. That's the point. Cockroaches, I, I think we can understand that cockroaches have intention to sheltering, uh, to shelter, uh, uh, of, of sheltering. But the, the robot is not sheltering uh, him, uh, the, the, the himself. And so uh, my point is uh, uh, what we can uh, 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 infer from these observations uh, about the problem of intentionality and group behavior as an intentional behavior. That's my Quite interesting that uh, you are ready to grant it cockroaches intentionality, but not robots. Uh, it's interesting because well, the last animal on the planet I think we would grant it intentionality to would be cockroaches. What kind of intentionality could have? So let's try to translate intentionality in cockroaches. What makes you think that they have intentionality? The fact that they prefer uh, shelter. They prefer less light than, yes, to be in the shadow. Well, in that sense that cockroaches prefer something, and they are, if you like, Determined biological, biologically determined to prefer that, but Alice has uh, nationality as well because Alice is programmed to prefer uh, shadows. The, in, uh, the, the outcome is interesting because by uh, downloading a very simple behavioral program in this robot. They were able to emulate the cockroach behavior, and when left, when they are alone, only robots, they end up doing the same thing they do when they are with cockroaches, because they they also interact with cockroaches. So and then they are among themselves, they do exactly the same. That is, when you behave like a cockroach, you end up 
being a talk about in that sense. You end up, like, what is uh, behaving like in Cobras? It's behaving under the preference bias they have. So, the thing with intentionality is also overrated. Because intentionality is hard. I can't think of intentionality by, by humans, but in cockroaches. But if we, we accept that result, which is very simple, it's, there, there's nothing there to be added. If the robot did not prefer shadows, they would not be accepted, they would not act like a cockroach. But if we accepted that, well, we can see that we humans, we have preferences as well. And our way of behavior are also determined by that kind, that preferences we have. is not something we can, uh, of course, we have lots and lots of flexibility, much, much more flexibility than cockroaches. It's not the point. I'm not saying in the sense that, uh, if, you, if you see, we, are, we have more options. Our behavior are more flexible. But nothing there gives us the chance to say that we are free. In that sense, in the sense that philosophy gives to the world. So, as I, I quoted in, in, in that, uh, if you compare the principles, the very materialistic principles, with the idea that we are free, we can't not understand where, where freedom comes from in this model. So we have more options, we have we are more flexible, whatever you want. But we are also, as every other uh, biological being, determined by preferences, and we make decisions on the light of that preferences. Without parameters, there is no decision possible. It, it, this is also logic. If you don't have premises, you can you, you can have a, a conclusion. You have just an extra. What is the parameters we uh, we have to make decisions? Yes, well, our preferences is very important. Our preference is connected with aggregation and living together. So, so I don't know. That was to to rush. Event, but uh, the idea is uh, let's change intentionality in the sense we, we understand it by preferences. So perhaps there we, we can hope something. Yeah, uh, may, may I add something? Um, if you think of uh, uh, cockroaches as a um, biological device and the robot as a non-biological device, they are behaving the same way. They are having the same preference. In this particular, uh, because it's a very, um, you know, um, narrow experiment. It's just to, to assess if they prefer the shelter or the unsheltered environment. They, they would prefer the sheltered environment. In that sense, the biological and the, the non-biological have the same uh, um, behavior. My point is my point is that uh, uh, intentionality or preference. Uh, we I, I don't think we move uh, for another kind of conception. It's, uh, we are in, inside the same uh, domain of conception. Uh, preference, intentions, all of them uh, presuppose mind. Okay, uh, that's the point. Robots don't have mind. And so uh, they don't, they cannot have preference, intentions, and nothing like that. Uh, uh, only functionalists like Dennett accept this, that because uh, uh, the description of an intentionality for Dennett, for example, is only an external description of the behavior of, of an entity like a robot or a cockroach or a human being. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is that we are look, uh, we as accept that we have something different. That's, that's the, the real big problem. Uh, uh, we accept that even cockroaches uh, uh, don't behave like robots, because uh, if we uh, think cockroaches as robots, uh, uh, they are not animals. <laughs> they are other kind of entities. But, um,
this point, uh, we may say that um, we don't, uh, uh, we may not infer that there is um, intention, but uh, we can say that there is preference. If they, uh, they don't go to one place, if they go to another one, you, you can call this preference. I, they prefer one scenario to the other scenario. It's a, it's a uh, kind of a dichotomic pathway, and then they, 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 they dislike one and they like the other one, or prefer, uh, they, they choose more frequently. Statistically, it's not incorrect to say that there is a bias or a preference. And, and more interesting. Bi bi bias is a better word, I think. And more interesting, they not only choose the shelter. They group the larger number in one place than in another place. And that was not mm -hmm. previously determined by the program. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a, a very important uh, consequence. But it's interesting that you accept that cockroach has mind. Yeah, has mind. Kind of mind. <laughs> has mind. Well, mind. Yeah. That shows this is a philosophical prejudice. Yeah. Uh, even a cockroach can have mind, but not a robot. So, if you accept that cockroach has uh, a cockroach has mind, so that's <laughs> yeah, that's so To contribute a little bit and to ask um, Flavio, um, I had this question. I, I I wrote this question when you were speaking. That was, uh, if you think that the body seeks for for an equilibrium, okay, uh, could we say that our body seeks to be healthy? Do you think that or not? So, because when you were speaking, I was thinking about that because you saw you were describing a kind of malignant circularity that destroys the body. Is it possible that the body uh, finds a way to get out of this bad circularity or not? Um, that's, it, that's my question and. Did this would be related to what was discussed because if we can compare, it's a little bit uh, outside, but okay. We, if we can compare the cockroach with the robot, so we can we say that uh, the material dependency of the choices are similar in the cockroach than in the robot? You see, my, my, the, the second question would be this. Um, the cockroach is uh, doing some choices because uh, of what it is made of, of what organic material it is made of. So could we say the same of the robot or not? Uh, okay. Just last question. You are talking about the biological history of cockroach, of being a cockroach, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, you are. Uh, you have gone all this way through the evolution to become this uh, thing that you act in this in this manner. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. It helps way, to survive. That yeah. way, uh, cockroaches have some wisdom, right? Um, let's say. Right. Embodied. Yeah. Embodied. Yeah. Embodied. Yeah. Embodied. Yeah. Embodied wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> so you say more than I was saying, but okay. <laughs> well, so uh, coming back to the the uh, will the the body or the mind uh, be able to to get out of the the um, uh, this destructive cycle? Um, uh, this uh, my vision of that is um, uh, within uh, a certain embodied between comets, um, amount of stress, the body can find the solution because it is programmed or, or uh, uh, is made in a way that it can take some amount of stress. When it goes beyond, then uh, 
all the evidence suggests that the, the system is failing, right, and the, the dismantling, right. So, uh, um, uh, you know, the solution can find within the, the embodied limited, limitation uh, and not out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get out of it, then you have, uh, you know, the the deleterious process that we, we call disorder or disease or uh, illness or destruction or deterioration. So, yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, my question is to Adriano. The title of your talk was Embodied Mor Morality, right? I, I, I want to focus on the morality, not in the emb embodied part. Of it, but um, it, uh, it's pretty pretty clear to me, and I think to everyone that um, morality is about behavior, right? And you talk about preferences a lot, right? Um, it's just not clear to me um, if you're thinking. I mean, I understand it's about behavior, but it's not clear to me if you're talking, you're, if you're describing behavior or you're if you're prescribing behavior, because morality discourse seems to be about prescribing what should be done, what what is what right what kind of behavior should be performed and not just what people usually do, what behavior is usually performed. So I, I think this problem, um, I think this this lack of clarity between description of behavior and prescription of behavior leads to other problems that um, I think in that part when you said morality helps people decide what is more important, not for them, but for the group. Then, how big is the group? What What is the group? What constitutes the group? Is it a, uh, a city, Western civilization? Is it mankind? You know, and then if it's mankind, uh, we can uh, do whatever we want to other species. If it's uh, smaller than mankind, we, we can disrespect other ethnicities and all that. So, anyway. That, that's that's my point. Because if you're if you engage in describing how people behave, there will be many um, many kinds of behavior that some people find bad, evil, and, and but you could justify by this group thinking. So uh, to make it short, description of behavior and prescription of behavior. It seems that moral is, is more related to the second, not to just describing how people act. Thank you for, for the question. It helps me try to clarify the point. Uh, in fact, this uh, very <coughs> traditional way to uh, make the leap I was criticizing in my talk from uh, the embodied morality we have and <clears throat> in virtue of which we survive the natural selection to a kind of morality only us in the universe can have because only, only us can measure the goodness of our actions. This leap is very tight connected with a theory of value we have. I, I can't explain that in, in details, but uh, we, we usually think in mora morality in terms of absolute values. Whatever people do, there is the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. Well, when you put this in, in the perspective of evolutionism, it's completely nonsense. Of course, what we do, we mostly do. So we don't. It's, it's not to, to look uh, each the action of each individual and to see is that or, or group of individuals. No, think in terms of evolution. In, th in terms of evolution, is selection by by pressure. So. Uh, what we do is good because we are able to create, to, to, to breed. So this perspective, which is mainly descriptive, entails a theory of values that is 
there is no absolutely absolute value. There is no metaphysical value. There is no metaphysical good. What is good? What is good is what is functional. And what is functional depends highly on our interaction with the environment we are living in. Well, but of course, this is the explanation of, of the fact. Once, once we have all the abilities we have, and we, once we are living in a society, in a group, so there is pressure from every side. And the result of, of, of all of these this pressures are a way of life in this group. So this way of life is not something that is predetermined in our genes. So we, we can share different values in different parts of the world. Although we, are, we cannot have all kinds of values, there are some limits for the kind of values we can uh, share and still be able to reproduce our society. So uh, uh, considering this, we have to change also to move our prescriptive morality to the place, to, to the, the interaction of this person and to see where it's a problem of normativity, and it's a very complicated problem. I'm not ready to, to explain that here. But uh, you see, normativity is a result of this interaction of a certain number, number of, of people creating a, a way of life together. Just like the robots, when they interact, they choose, so to speak, a place rather than other place. This is the result of the interaction. We do the same, and the result is the Brazilian society, uh, the society in my home, uh, whatever you want. So, but we share mostly the same bias, the same. We share something in common which is not irrelevant, quite the opposite, very, very relevant. So. Uh, let me try to, to resume this. Prescri when we are talking about prescription, morality is about what people should do, should do in whatever circumstances. This is the Kantian perspective. And the Kantian perspective is, of course, very, uh, we should be able to explain why is that so interesting for people to defend that kind of, of vision. I think there is a functional uh, way to explain that. I won't go on that. But of course, it's not functional, because this, this value is so highly uh, uh, put it in a, in, a, in a pedestal so high that it's, imp it's impossible to follow. And that's exactly what Kant says. No matter if people act like this, this is a good thing to do. This is the right thing to do. Well, from the perspective of evolution, it's quite, diff quite different. So, there, when you come down from this theory of value, you can make sense of a description going to a prescription. Prescription is uh, a result of uh, interaction, demanding, changing demands among the individuals, and making society, political games, all of what you want. But if you see things, if we see things like that, we perhaps understand better the human, phenomenon of, of humanity then from the perspective of this absolute value. When we are, of course, like philosophers, love to be very, uh, I don't know the name in English, to judging. We judge everybody. We are like priests saying everybody's doing wrong. Uh, and, but I think there is some gain. There is some, uh, something to, 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 to to gain from philosophy more than that is better understand the phenomena of morality. And better understand the phenomena of morality, including better understand the phenomena of normativity, uh, which is not uh, related with national value. I don't know, lots of stuff there, but. <laughs> I first wanted to make a comment about something Marco was saying and then ask you some questions about the relationship between evolution and, and morality. 
I think, um, Mark, I may be you're reading too much into this talk of, of preferences. And uh, I, I agree um, with, with Adrian that the, the robot and the, and the cockroach are on a par. Uh, one example you, that you might think about is uh, the tendency of sunflowers to track the sun or vines to climb toward the top of the tree. It seems to me that those are no more indications of, of preferences than what the cockroach does or what the robot does. These are, are hardwired behaviors um, and very different from the sorts of preferences we attribute to, to each other when we have in mind something like a variety of options and we deliberate, reflect on our interests and on the basis of this deliberation choose an option. That's, that's not what the, the cockroach is doing and it's it's not what the robot's doing. It's not what the sunflowers are doing. Um, so it's their preferences sort of only metaphorically, I think. Uh, the, the question I wanted to ask Adrian, I'm trying to understand exactly how you see the relationship between evolution and morality. So let me say a few things, and then you can tell me whether you agree with me or not. So I tend to think of morality as uh, objective. So what's good is good, it's not good for a particular species and bad for another species. It's, it's either right or wrong independently uh, of the species interests and of, of, of reproductive success. And uh, we've evolved capacities for understanding morality, but the truths of morality remain independent from us, just as we've evolved capacities to understand mathematics, but uh, mathematical claims are, are true or false independently of our, of our own interests. And I also think that um, uh, what's, what promotes fitness in a given individual has nothing to do with what's right or wrong. So some behaviors that might be fitness enhancing are in fact bad behaviors and some behaviors that harm fitness might in fact be good. And in fact, it's a, it's a puzzle how altruistic individuals who by definition are less fit than selfish individuals might still evolve. And um, some philosophers and evolutionary biologists have developed models to show how altruism might evolve, even though the altruistic individuals are less fit members of the group than the selfish individuals. So in that context, I wonder if you can sort of situate your own views on the relation between evolution and morality. Well, I, I disagree with the first part, uh, and I, I can't see how can you defend the first part and think seriously about the second part you are uh, talking about, in the sense that uh, it's really a very important question, how uh, altruistic behavior have occurred in, in nature, and but it's a good question because altruistic behavior is very useful in in in, in social society, in, 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 in social animals, and especially in, in our species. So, and if we accept that, so the first part must be wrong or right, independent of what what is the outcome. It makes no sense for me. So. I'm not a, a moral realist in that sense. So compare uh, morality with the certainty of mathematics, it's away from my, my, my perspective. It's exactly that kind of theory of value we are used to, to defend, and I think it's, which is very traditional. And, and I think there is a functional explanation for that. Uh, because, very short, say, uh, it's very important uh, for things like us, which are very, very flexible, to uh, predict the action of the other. So it's very useful to, to demand the other to follow a rule, a rule you can predict. So he will do that in the future because there is a rule telling him to do that in the future. So this capacity is really, really useful. Uh, moreover, in a society like ours, ours, which are very, very, very big. 
So, but I know it's not very far from sufficient to, to answer the question. So, but the second, and considering the second part, yes, it's a good question, and uh, models trying to, to explain how an altruistic behavior was possible are based exactly in, in most of them, in uh, game theories, yes, yes, game theories. So decisions, rational decisions, how it would be possible, or also in, in mathematical models and things like that. It's a fact that an altruistic behavior uh, has evolved. We see that. So if our model cannot explain that, perhaps we should include something more in our models in order to make them more powerful, to consider more uh, elements than it is considering. What I'm trying to do here is to, to, to say that perhaps we should look at these interactions going on and the mechanisms that uh, make possible interactions to occur and individuals to react to demand from the others and uh, so we would have another perspective. And perhaps we are very uh, concerned, too much concerned about view that individuals make decisions and they make decisions in their own benefit. What we def define with own benefit? We have preferences to live in groups. And it is in our benefit to do that. It causes pain not to be accepted. It causes pain. Not, a lot of things that have nothing to do with our, my own benefit in myself, let's put in things like that. You see? So I think the, 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 the whole view is a little bit more complex than the models, uh, the mathematical models based on individuals taking, making decisions could, uh, rep could, um, the pick called uh, inform us. So that would be my, my answer. So rejecting the platonic uh, perspective on values, and from there, well, really, we need to, an to answer the question how it's possible for us. What makes us more, in that sense? What makes us po uh, uh, capable of living the way we live? What, what kind of mind? Uh, brain do we need to live the way we live? May, may I add something? Um, maybe uh, in this way, um, the Darwinian evolution uh, usually matches what is right and what is good for me. Usually they go in the same direction, right? Uh, and this we will call common sense, right? What is right, what is good for me. Uh, when what is um, um, good for me differs from what is right, then we can see the moral behavior because it's not good for me, but it's right. Then we don't call this common sense, we call it moral, right? Uh, maybe the, the root is the same, is a, is a inherited set of rules, right, as, as he said. But uh, sometimes we can say that, well, he's just doing what is the, the common sense solution. It's uh, avoiding danger, for instance. But when he's sacrificing himself um, to avoid dangers for others, then you can see the moral uh, uh, emerging. Can I follow up on that? Almost all moral behavior is not beneficial to the moral agent, right? So if I wanted to, to increase my reproductive success, I'd be unfaithful to my wife all the time, right? I'd be cheating people. I'd be stealing. Um, I engage in very few of these behaviors. I won't tell you which ones. But um, so it's a mystery why as, as Adrian was putting it, why we've evolved these these codes because it's the one who breaks all these codes who's going to be most fit. Uh, so I, I think most of the time what makes evolutionary sense and what's moral 
diverge. It's very seldom that the two actually coincide. Uh, what I would say is that um, uh, it's, it makes sense to me that uh, uh, evolutionary, um, you can predict the behavior of uh, other people, right? Uh, if you are uh, to live in a community uh, like the humans uh, did since the, the uh, beginning. Um, if that is true, uh, it's uh, useful to, to, to have a set of roles that will be in the benefit of the whole group, but not in the, in the individual benefit. Um, what, what, um, what is good for the individual, like, uh, you know, be, be engaging uh, in not faithful uh, behaviors and, and uh, disregarding the, the, um, the affiliated behavior uh, to a more selfish behavior would not be for, for the good of the community, because uh, breaking these uh, general rules, uh, you cannot trust anybody and if you cannot trust anybody you don't you cannot uh, gather together to get food or, or do uh, common things because uh, you just cannot trust your your neighbor so uh, to me it makes sense that uh, y y we can have these moral uh, uh, behaviors uh, hardwired even if they are uh, in a in a more superficial uh, analysis uh, like uh, counterproductive but uh, you know in the long run and if you take the whole, they, 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 are, they, they are good. Uh, they are not um, um, common to you, right? Well, that's no. it. I, I think it's, it's, it's perfect. Uh, and the behaviors, as you described, has been, uh, has been tried for long periods. Chimpanzees are less faithful to their groups or wives than we are, and and so on. So what we are saying, and I agree completely with, with Fabi, is that our behavior, although we think it's a burden, so that's why I said morality is not a burden. It seems to us sometimes as a burden, but it in, in, uh, embodied in us like a result of our natural selection. The problem was that that kind of behavior wasn't successful enough. There was a period in time, I, I heard that from the spermatologist, we, are, we, are, we were dying like flies. So we were under very, very big pressure and the solution nature came up when we came up, our ancestors came up was this collective breeding and collective hunting, collective gathering, sharing food, all of that saved us. But saved us not in terms of, well, we made a decision or either we, we cooperate or we're going to die. That kind of contract never took place. So in that term, that it's, it seems that it's not natural. It seems that it's counterproductive, but it was tested. <laughs> yeah. let, let me just put in a very simple way. Um, common sense is how we behave. Moral is how we would like our neighbor to behave, right? <laughs> so <laughs> we would like to, uh, our neighbor to behave in a moral way, right? So we, we know that very well, what is moral, right? So it's, uh, how, how I want you to behave, <laughs> this is moral, right? <laughs> Just wanted to, to ask something. Uh, it's uh, additional to, to this discussion. Um, so, uh, at some point in your talk, uh, Adriana, you said that it, morality was not about following rules. I couldn't understand that. I, I thought maybe I understood wrongly. But you, maybe because of this uh, uh, um, that, uh, the negation of, of contractualism? I don't know. It's, because now you, you are talking both about truth, about norms, and biological norms, and so on. So where there are rules, and morality is also following rules. So, 
but not in the sense that, of course, it was, I said at the beginning, it was uh, propaganda and, and <laughs> provocative, but uh, not in the sense that it's mainly following rules. So what the aim of the talk was is to show that that kind of rules are embodied. So it's not because we agree that those are good rules, now we, are, we will behave under those rules. The point is, there are lots and lots of rules we can describe in our behavior. So, uh, the, 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 the scientists trying to emulate the cockroach behavior, they describe the rules of their behaviors. It does not follow that cockroach was following the rules in the sense, in intentional sense. So that was the claim. So, oh, they are not, they are not. <laughs> That's the point, they are not. <laughs> but we can describe their behavior as a behavior controlled by rules. So this, and it's very useful to, this, to do that. But the point is, so we also have in our behavior, uh, we follow some rules, not because we evaluate that those rules and think they are great, they are functional, they are good, they are moral, but that's the way we live, that's the way we, we do things as humans. But of course, on top of all of that, because we are so capable, because we are so social, because we are we were able to build this complex society, on top of that, we can create rules, and uh, norms and contracts and all of that, which help us to extend the benefit of the kind of life we, we learned in, uh, by, the, by our body living in, in nature and being selected this way. I don't know if this, if this explains a little bit. So, it is not a naive redu reductionism. It's not to say everything is in the gene. So I'm well aware that we are more flexible than that. But let us not throw away the ladder we use to climb at this high. And I just would like to add, there is something about the moral which is likable. Uh, you know, uh, if you see someone behaving in a moral way, uh, maybe uh, this is uh, something that's causing suffering or, or um, is just having a hard time, but uh, it, it gives you an inner feeling of, uh, of something that is good, actually. Um, uh, you see, there is a, a, a kind of rewarding uh, mm -hmm. uh, thing about seeing someone behaving in a moral way, like we, we admire, you know, well, this is this guy, do, I would never do that, but he's doing the proper thing. When you do the same, you, yeah. you feel uh, yeah. pride about yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You feel, well, I, I, I went against the odds, but I did it. Right? It's kind of reinforcing me, and I, I feel good about that. It's like, a, it's like preference. You mean, I mean, uh, in a way, uh, it's a hardwired behavior. A hard? Yeah, hardwired means, uh, uh, you know, something that you do kind of automatically, instinctively, and there is a set of um, rows in there prior to, uh, to the action. Oh, uh, uh, I want to come back to some uh, question. Uh, the problem of the difference between describing and prescribing is a uh, um, core problem in, in moral philosophy and uh, uh, yes we think in moral theory that moral theory uh, usually uh, prescribe uh, a moral theory is a prescriptive uh, theory uh, well uh, we have more than moral theory in ethics we have metaethics that is not prescriptive uh, a meta-ethical meta uh, uh, enterprise is descriptive, 
right? So we can describe uh, the way uh, we behave philosophically without, uh, this, uh, well, some sense conceptual, uh, uh, without uh, committing ourselves to any prescriptive uh, theory. I don't know, but uh, but I think uh, uh, you are right that uh, one problem uh, is uh, to how we can understand morality in the prescriptive sense in a naturalistic guise, uh, and then uh, uh, this I uh, understood your question to Adriano, and uh, my conclusion is that uh, Adriano. Uh, thinks that we can live uh, without moral theory. That, uh, I don't think we will we agree with that. But I think moral theory, uh, we, can, we, we need to rid of uh, moral theory. Uh, uh, what we need is possibly meta-ethics and empirical ethics without moral theory. Okay, uh, without the ontology, without consequentialism, without any moral theory. Mm, this is my interpretation, uh, uh, and I th and I think we we have, of course, and we need, of course, a good descriptive theory of our human moral capacities. Uh, but uh, to do a good moral theory uh, in a, a naturalistic. Uh, Field, uh, or uh, we need first something that uh, Adriano uh, excludes. Uh, uh, he excluded, for example, the question what morality is. Uh, uh, you, you presented three questions, and the first is we don't need to answer this question what morality is, but what is mor what morality is for. And okay, uh, but I think we need uh, to ask what morality is, and if we uh, try to answer this question using our conceptual uh, training uh, that as philosophers, we will find that we people use uh, 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 use it to, to 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 think about moral questions in a confused way, uh, in a very uh, different. Uh, 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 way, and uh, and so we need to use our conceptual uh, capacities to understand what people mean uh, uh, by uh, mora morality, and uh, and when they uh, uh, speak, uh, when they uh, talk about morality, and when they use a moral vocabulary, uh, what they are actually doing. Uh, so I think we need to answer the question what morality is. And uh, this is my, uh, I want to understand what you mean exactly by we don't need to ask what morality means. Uh, uh, yes, because we don't need to be Kantian uh, for answering this question. Uh, uh, we can uh, try to answer uh, this question uh, without committing ourselves to a rationalistic conception of morality. We can describe what people, uh, what we, human, uh, what community, human community, uh, use it to mean or mean by morality and uh, uh, if it's not a confused way uh, which kind, for example, uh, we can uh, differenti differentiate uh, uh, between the ontological uh, questions uh, and consequence consequentialist question and look for a place in our behavior. Uh, uh, well, uh, for example, what the other thing, uh, morality is not only a problem of uh, cooperation. It's not only morality is, uh, is, is more than uh, than that. Uh, the, 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 
the conflict between the ontology and consequence, consequentialism is, I think, within this, uh, this problem of, or, uh, that is, uh, morality is not only uh, a device for improving our cooperative uh, uh, success. Uh, we have more than uh, than this. Well, I think we uh, uh, we we need still need a place for conceptual uh, analysis uh, in ethics. That's my point. I would say that uh, by not beginning with the question what morality is, but what morality is for, uh, we end up answering the first question by answering the second one. Of course, what morality is. Morality is what morality is for. But when you start with what morality is, and you ask people what morality is, of course, lots of analysis must be done to discover that they are dealing with quite different concepts, quite different. They think morality is what is good. They put morality and goodness at the same level. So this is linguistic uh, investigation of what people mean when they say morality. And I think this is uh, not very enlightened for the question the, the important question is on morality itself. So if you start with what morality is for, we end up answering the question, of course, what morality is, because morality is what it is for. And, I, of course, morality is, or is there in order to improve something, to improve our life. It's interesting uh, that you say, no, it's not only that which means you believe in a kind of value that although it would lead the humanity to a disgrace, no matter that, well, this is the right thing to do. This is not the way, to say like a human, nature treated us. Nature, because of that, did not trust reason <laughs> uh, to, to orient our behavior. Is that to improve? And when we demand for more morality, we are demanding for more improvement because a moral environment is more productive, people are better in, live better, they are more happy. They so it's not a, a thing that it's a separate from uh, utility, from uh, functionality, quite the opposite. Although individually people think, well, this is a burden. I would be happier if I were in this relationship. I would be freer. But you see what happens with people who go through, through that path. Two years after, they are miserable, they are alone, they are, if they are normal people. They are, <laughs> you see, it's, uh, we hate the pressure of the, the others, but we live for that. It's not that simple. It's not that, oh, what wonderful life I would have if I were a social party. <laughs> okay. There is one biological concept that helps, I think, with the, the to, to kind of uh, reconcile the, the Darwinism with Mao, which is the proximal and distal reward, right? For instance, uh, proximal reward means uh, I want to be be happy now, and I want to, to you know, do whatever is necessary to, to um, satisfy uh, my needs. Right? This is proximal. The distal is I should refrain from doing certain things in order to be sex successful uh, uh, later on. Right? Usually the moral relates to this later on, but uh, anyways, uh, it is uh, hardwired in, in the sense that he is talking about. Why you David Hume Kardinsky? It's perfect. Uh, I can only thank him. <laughs> <laughs> 
question. There are a lot of questions in my mind right now. Uh, so, uh, but, but I will ask you uh, only one of them. Uh, it's about uh, the, the one, uh, your answer to Professor Shapiro. Uh, you divided the, the question in two parts, and you talked about a platonic perspective about this idea of uh, of something kind of innate. But then I, I ask you, uh, after the success of some behavior, after generations, because I think it is uh, inherited by the, the future generations, then it, uh, don't you think that it became some sort of uh, platonic, but not in the same sense that Plato uh, put it, uh, but uh, some sort of object, objective law that the, the next generations just adopt kind of unconscious of it? Uh, for example, uh, we are we are talking. You are we are talking about uh, 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 a faithful faithful husband, for example. For example, then it uh, reminded me about a book, uh, Helen Fisher book. It is called uh, Why We Love. Then it, uh, it, she tries to explain how love happens in three moments, and uh, the third moment is the moment of the of this uh, attachment. Uh, the explanation is very, very interesting, the way he, she uh, put it. But uh, she explains why we are, we are uh, faithful, for example. It's to raise our children. It's necessary because we are not ready to live when we were born. So we need to, to uh, the care of our parents. And uh, anyway, it's an interesting book. Uh, then I ask you if we cannot, uh, if it uh, do you think it's po is it possible for us to connect it, the idea of objective law in this sense, in this sense, not in the platonic, not in the in the metaphysical sense, because you can conceive an idea of uh, objective uh, rule without to think it uh, as a metaphysical rule. I think it, they are not uh, they not they not exclude each other. I don't know. If the way you are describing things, I, I, I agree. I, I, what I meant was the, the idea of goodness in itself, this metaphysical idea of something being good in itself, no matter, no matter what. So what you are saying is quite different. It's objective in the sense that it has proven useful. It has proven um, good. So... I'm not saying that there is no good things. There is no, there isn't a difference between what, what is good and what what's bad. Of course not. There is a difference, but it's relative, and it is it must must be steady and it's related objectively, in that sense, not in the metaphysical, to the way the way we are hardwired by nature, and the way we need to provide for new generations and so on. So to go to, the, to your example, uh, what was the solution for the nature, solution of the nature for the problem of raising kids for so long? You may say it's love. It's a kind of attachment that you cannot be uh, rid of after your uh, 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 procreational duties are done. So it's not by by uh, making the individual to reflect and conclude that, well, if I'm not with my wife, I will lose my kids. So I have to be, it's not that kind of argument. It's some kind of an attachment you cannot be rid of. And without it, you suffer a lot. So you are hardwired to be there because it makes it's good for you because it makes you, it's good for you in the sense that it makes you happy. It's not just a burden, an incredible burden. It's, I have to endure this in order to raise my kids. Because, why? Because the nature demands it. When you answer, there is no reason to, for you to raise your kids. You could say, well, to hell with all of that. I want to be free. I don't want anything. 
we are not that independent. We are not that autonomous. That's the idea. We cannot do that. I'm not saying individuals cannot do that. But in general, if this was a rule, it was the, the main behavior, the dominant behavior, we wouldn't be here to tell the story. Um, I was thinking about the egoism against altruist behavior and the evolutionary advantage of both of them. And it's the fact that uh, living in social groups was essential to our uh, survival, evolutionary speaking. So in, in that sense, I think that being well viewed by the group is more important than get more meal, for example. You can be the best hunter. If you don't share your food, you will provoke uh, bad reactions for the rest of the group. You can be the most uh, strong male in the group, and you can make a lot of children. But if you don't take care of them, you'll be uh, suffer some sort of censorship by the rest of the group. You do not, disper uh, you do not provoke sympathy in that sense. So uh, I'd just like to put a scenario. If you are good to the ones you live with, uh, the chance to get more benefit for them is stronger than if you act uh, in a selfish way. And uh, you can have a lot of empirical data today for different species where uh, being, let's say, fair in a certain way, like sharing food, do not uh, lead by fear of others uh, have a huge advantage. Um, for example, if you pick up wolves, the breeding pair are not the stronger pair. Are not the stronger male. Are not the, uh, they are not the best hunter. They are more empathic of the group. And they can lead the best hunters to do their job, for example. In that sense, uh, and if you have a wolf that are uh, antisocial, for example, a psychopath, he acts selfish, he does not share the food, he steal food, he'll be bullied. He'll suffer bullying. And if he's uh, too antisocial, he's going to be killed by the rest of the group or expelled. So uh, if you pick up this data and an analyze that, you can see that Selfish behavior, if that's the rule, they probably will not have survived. They'll kill each other. So I don't think, I don't see how selfish behavior, selfish behavior could be the most important rule of evolution. But when you put it against, I will not say altruistic behavior necessarily, but a behavior that shows uh, more interesting in the, and follow the rule of the group then go against and just satisfy the selfish desire or something like that. Larry. A definite way of defining selfishness and, and altruism. By definition, the, the altruist is less fit than the selfish individual. And it sounds like what you're describing is a situation where the less fit organism is the selfish one. So that's just to sort of change the meanings of these terms that the evolutionary biologists use them. Um, so an example um, might be altruism has been studied in uh, kind of a virus. And some members of this virus population reproduce at a, at a higher rate. And because they're reproducing at a higher rate, they kill their host uh, more quickly than the viruses that reproduce at a, at a lower rate. And so by their terminology, the selfish viruses are the ones that reproduce at a higher rate because they're fitter. They produce more organisms, um, more offspring. And the altruistic ones are just the ones that produce fewer offspring. So that it's just 
to determine selfishness and altruism, you just count the number of offspring, and the altruist ones are the ones that always produce fewer offspring. So it sounds like your wolf case is a case where, although the behavior appears selfish, it's actually altruistic, right? or vice versa. Oh, I understand what you're saying. I can use that. <laughs> Again, I didn't take this course. Um, well, um, what I'm trying to say when I talk about selfish against altruistic, and I don't like the word altruistic because that's uh, too extreme, I think. But uh, Selfish behavior, I'm saying that the behavior, when I put my uh, sexual desires, my, like you said, my instant uh, desires in front of those long-term uh, advantages. That's uh, what I'm calling like a selfish behavior. And that's not what we can see through our evolutionary research that shows more uh, fit to survival. So, if you don't care about your offspring and just want to have sex, <laughs> uh, probably your offspring will, will not survive. If you care for your for your offspring, if you care for the group, the chance uh, the chances are much higher of that group survive, and your genes that are passed through the next generation, and so on, so on, and that kind of behavior will be. Uh, preserved. So that's the, the two points that I'm trying trying to to say that uh, satisfied uh, intense desire, for example, might not be uh, the rule of evolution or the main rule or the stronger force in our natural, uh, natural history. It's more important. It shows more important, it shows more efficient the behavior that care for the ones you live with. You might kill the other group, but the group that you are living, you can, uh, you, um, how can I say that? You will uh, give yourself a little bit. Not be completely altruistic, but you show some sympathy for, for them. And the advantage uh, gains that you receive it's much higher than steal the food or cheat your your pair or something like that. So in that way, selfish behavior is not the main force of evolution, at least in social mammals, for example. That's, that's the scenario I, I, I like to put. Now, I would have just one comment. Um, if, uh, in terms, in the terms that Larry described, uh, altruism and selfishness, it, 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 it turns out that our selfishness is altruistic in the sense that by being selfish, we manage to have more uh, offsprings, and that was strongly dependent on our ability to be altruistic. So <laughs> it's it's almost a truism that if selfishness means more offsprings, then of course we are selfish. But uh, the way we are selfish is well, by being a little bit altruistic. Without that, we wouldn't be able to be so successful in, in having our, our offspring. That's a, so the paradox disappears. It's, it's <laughs> Sorry to go on about it. Um, one of my colleagues, Elliot Silver, has, uh, in collaboration with uh, an evolutionary biologist, David Sloan Wilson, he's developed uh, a model for explaining how 
the proportion of altruists in the population can increase, even though, by definition, the altruistic individual is always less fit than the selfish individual. And it sounds paradoxical. If, if the altruist always has fewer offspring than the selfish individual, how is it that over generations you end up with a population in which there are more altruists than selfish individuals? Um, it sounds like a paradox, but in fact, it, it can happen under certain conditions. And, you know, maybe this isn't the place, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss how this paradox can actually be resolved when, you know, if you ever want to hear it. <laughs> Since I am the coordinator of the uh, session, I just want to make huh? some, uh, give some information okay. before. I okay. So tomorrow, uh, so we will close for today. But uh, tomorrow we start again at uh, 2 p.m. at the afternoon, and we will have the the meeting during the afternoon and also at the evening with uh, the last talk, Larry's uh, talk about mental uh, causal exclusion. And I want to invite who, who, who wants to a dinner tomorrow, not paid, but I, I <laughs> But I want to invite who wants to come with us, okay? So I, I am giving this first announcement about the dinner, and tomorrow we will decide where to go, uh, okay? Um, our first choice is uh, a restaurant in Porto Alegre, but we are not sure yet, okay? Um, and I think that's... That's it for today. I thank you very much. I thank you, Flavio, Adriano, Larry, and all the participants. Until tomorrow, 2 p.m., okay? 2 p.m., okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.